if there's things that you can't do that the average person should be able to do, what should we able to be able to do? We should be able to, you know, do a light run. We should be able to climb. We should be able to squat and deadlift and rotate and press and row. We should have decent energy throughout the day. We should have normal sleep when we go to bed. Like we shouldn't have heartburn all the time and digest. Like these things that we treat as symptoms all the time, like look at the root cause. You'd be surprised at how different your life could be if you just if you just spent a little time and took that kind of responsibility. Otherwise, you're literally putting your health in someone else's hands. One of the biggest challenges when it comes to success, fitness success or otherwise, is that we tend to focus on the symptoms and not the root cause. If your shoulder hurts, if your knee hurts, if your hip hurts, if you can't squat properly, stop remedying the problem by fixing the symptom. Find the root cause and you'll solve the issue. That's easy to say, but there's just industries around uh, solving these uh, immediate symptoms. Right? Oh my gosh. Are you kidding me? It's uh, the whole entire medical industry is based off of symptom care uh, and not solving the root issue. Do you think that's in every country or do you think that it's predominantly in our, our country where we're like that? I think that um, that old medical, you know, if you want to say medical or healthcare type systems, so like Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine. Yeah. Uh, they were very much about finding the root cause, right? Uh, Western medicine, um, which is extremely effective and which is why it's such it's spread around the world, right? Like if you want any kind of medicine that'll keep you alive and, and solve a lot of health issues or whatever, Western medicine just, just does a great job. Uh, but it's very, it can be very symptomatic focused and not root cause. So like, for example, if you have a chronic skin condition, uh, let's say you have like psoriasis or eczema, really common, right? What they'll do is they'll try to figure out a way to solve the rash or the rough skin, but not really look at what is causing this to happen in the first place, right? Um, I mean, I talked about, I have psoriasis and I remember I saw a dermatologist for almost a decade before we ever like, I and I would constantly ask like diet questions and stuff and She'd be like, no, no, no. And they just yeah. give me shots and the cream, shots yep. and cream, shots and cream, shots and cream on it. Like there was, there was no, there's nothing else that I could, I could do like, yeah. or even explore. And I remember being so frustrated mm -hmm. later on. I remember when we first got together on, on mind pump, um, you had brought the article about vitamin D to me. And at, this was before I knew that I had, uh, I was deficient in vitamin D at all. And that there's like this direct, you know, correlation between vitamin, like low vitamin D levels and people that have psoriasis. And it's, it's super obvious to me when just by me bringing my vitamin D levels up, how much better my psoriasis is. And like, that's just not how they're, that's not how they are taught in school. It's yeah. literally, it's like, they're, they're always looking at like some, some medicine to put a band aid on that, on that one situation versus diving into the root cause. Well, I think too, I mean, it's, it takes a lot of detective work, a lot of testing, a lot of, um, you know, effort and, and, uh, time spent. Whereas if you can just give a patient something that's going to resolve like this immediate issue they have, like that's, it, it just seems like we fell into that sort of a system <clears throat> versus, you know, really finding some, doctor that would be able to work with you on testing and tracing back and looking at, you know, multiple sources of environment sources, genetic sources, like, you know, getting, getting a lot of data. So taking, getting a lot of data takes a lot of is time. Is it the arrogance? What is it? What That's, is it? I think Justin's right because, uh, yeah, but why do we not do that? Because finding yeah. the root cause and then solving the root cause is a lot of work. It's a lot of responsibility. For example, um, that's a stupid answer. It's true, right? Like, think about it this way. I feel it's like human behavior, though. I feel like yes, that's why, that's why I feel the like there's more. Like it. It's more of an arrogance that we we are the we have the best. We're the best as far as solving problems when it comes to health issues, like acute stuff, like you're saying. Therefore, we have all the answers. Versus, oh, let's dig into all these. Well, problems. so here's so I think that there's some truth to that too. But think about it this way, right? Um, I'll use a simple example. Somebody's like. Oh, squatting, you know, bothers my knees. So I'm not going to squat anymore, right? That's mm -hmm. the symptom. No longer squat or I'll put a knee wrap on or I'll use this machine instead. Whereas the root would be, well, let's figure out why you can't do this fundamental human movement and let's solve that. But that takes a lot of work, corrective exercise, maybe have to talk to some experts, figure out what the hell's going on. I'll make an, I'll, I'll use an even more broad um, analogy. These days, I think most people know the behaviors that cause obesity. 
Okay, I think most people know if we sat down the average person, and and I'm not saying it's simple in the sense of how they apply it and change their behaviors, and obviously that's what we have our whole show about. But I think the average person could tell you, well, yeah, you know, I I, I don't eat very good and I'm not very active. They would generally understand that. But if I had a pill right now I invented that would just make you lose weight, I'd be the richest man in the world and everybody would buy it, right? Even if it didn't improve anybody's health, if it just made them lose weight, I would still be the richest man in the world. So I think it's, it's, it has a lot to do with the fact that there's a lot. Look, I'll, I'll use a personal example. My son, my youngest, right? He's 20, he's about to turn 21 months. So he's not even two years old yet. He was getting kind of this weird like little rash on the back of his legs and maybe a little bit in the crook of his elbow. And his digestion was kind of weird, not super bad, but kind of weird. Like sometimes he'd be constipated. Sometimes he'd be a little, you know, too soft or whatever. Now we, and I, and I, I, I talked to Jessica and I said, let's have the doctor look at the rash, make sure it's not fungal infection or something that, you know, that we can treat. Cause there are things that Western medicine is very good at. So she went, this was a while ago and the doctor's like, Oh, um, you know, we could put a cream on that. And we're like, well, hold on a second. Like, is it fungal infection? Is it bacterial? No, but this will, you know, it's anti, it, it'll bring the cord. It's like cortisone, right? So it'll, it'll help with the, with the reaction and whatever. And I love, I know a lot of parents that'll just do that, rub it on. Yeah, yeah. It's starting to look better. Now, thankfully my wife is like, she's very ardent about finding the root cause. So she's like, no, that doesn't make any sense. Let's figure out what the hell's going on. So we went and worked with, uh, Dr. Becky Campbell, functional medicine prep. That's why I love, functional medicine practitioners like Dr. Becky Campbell, like Dr. Stephen Cabral, mm -hmm. two of our favorites, right? So we did testing. Now this took work. We had to take his poop. We had to send it to a lab. They had to analyze it. She had to come back. In the meantime, she said, let's have him do an, a low histamine diet, which meant we had to eliminate all kinds of foods. So now we're limited. So we're doing that for a while, which if you have a one and a half year old, know what a yeah. pain in the ass it is to get them to eat you know, certain foods anyway. So we're doing that kind of stuff that helped with the symptoms, but that's not the cure, right? Eventually we saw there was some dysbiosis. We tried a couple treatments. One of them didn't work. The other one did started to balance out his gut bacteria. Guess what? The rash is gone. His digestion is getting better. That This is like a, a month and a half of work and my wife having to go here, do this yeah, test, do right. that, watch all the food. We got to do this, inform my family when they go, when he goes over someone's house. The part that I find weird is that the, <clears throat> that the original doctor, she doesn't even mention that as like a possibility or an option. That's the part that annoys me. It's not a part of Western medicine. Because I get that. That's yeah. what I mean. I get yeah. that it's, I get that it's, it's, it's arduous. And I know that you have to go through this long old process of getting to the root cause or whatever that, but it, I, I feel like the, the doctor should at least explain that to you. Like, well, we could just put this cream on it, and that will help suppress it. This could, what, it would, or you could go through down this process, which might be a little bit longer. But then you get. I mean, I wish they. I wish they would at least communicate that. I, I do too. It's just not a part of the system for That's two stupid. reasons. That's stupid. I agree. Not. I think. And is it just us? Like Doug, when you were in Japan, what was Japan? Do you remember that? Like what it was like there. As far as medicine is concerned, yeah, yeah. they're very Western medicine. Or oh, so they're like us yeah. then. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, okay, we got to give credit where credit's due. Western medicine solved some of humanity's biggest problems, but it's not perfect. And what happened is we threw away a lot of old wisdom mm -hmm. um, because now we had these quick solutions for problems that were real, like antibiotics. I mean, come on, without antibiotics, boy, the world would, it would be really challenging, right? But we, as, as a result, and painkillers are wonderful. Mm -hmm. Like if you have pain, God, could you imagine what it would be like to get surgery before anesthesia or, you know, having a migraine without, you know, modern, you know, medicine or whatever, it would, be, it would suck, right? But because of that, um, and because people don't want to do the hard work, like if you're a doctor, if you're a doctor and you deal with um, heart health, you know how many obese people vascular surgeons have to deal with? Mm -hmm. Now, you think the vascular surgeon doesn't tell people, hey, you should probably look at your diet and your exercise. Of course they do. Nobody does it. So instead they're like, well, here's a surgery that I could do. And here's some medicine, medication that you could go take. Plus, and you know the training it takes to be that kind of a doctor now, let me ask you guys this. Well, how, what kind of training does it take to make someone an effective coach to help someone change their diet and their ex I mean, right. exercise? Mm -hmm. That's like another five to 10 years of experience coaching. So it's like, uh, it's a really, really tough. So really, it falls on the consumer is my point here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, You yourself have to do the work and take your health into your own hands and do the work and realize that you're not going to get the answer the first, second, third time. You kind of got to be like a sleuth and you got to really look for, and, I, and I'm bringing it back to fitness. If something hurts 
or something doesn't feel right, don't just avoid the movement. You should be able to do almost, you should be able to do every standard, unless there's a major issue, you should be able to do every standard exercise. When I say standard, I'm not talking about the crazy ones, right? Standard. You should be able to squat. You should be able to lift something off the ground like a deadlift. You should be able to press above your head. You should be able to rotate okay. If you can't do this stuff, don't band-aid it. Figure out what the hell is going on. Solve the root. And you and you can and once you figure it out, you'll solve it. You'll be able to do those things. That's yeah, my whole point. It's just like, you know, we look at it as a, you know, the body has multiple systems, but um it, you know, based off of like past examples, a lot of these doctors have a specialties within, you know, those systems. Oh, yeah. And so it's like what you see, like there's already sort of a bias of like how I can treat this. Like this is, totally. this is what I do. You know, this works. Like even if it's like 80% of the time, it's like I'm just going to keep hammering this point home. Uh, whereas, you know, there's going to be people with outliers where you give them something, it's going to have a totally different effect for them. And, you know, they're not considering other systems of the body that react and then have an adverse reaction. Yeah, 100%. So let's say, give you an example. Let's say you're a man and you go to the doctor and you're like, oh, I feel down. I just feel down. I don't have a lot of energy. Like, you know, I kind of feel blank or whatever. So the doctor sends you to a psychiatrist, right? Psychiatrist is like, oh, well, you're depressed. Here's some antidepressant medications, or you're anxious. Here's some anxiety medication. Okay. Now imagine if the doctor sent you to a uh, God, what's the name of a male male specialist doctor that, that works with uh, with men in particular? Oh, Not, a proctologist. Maybe a proctologist or somebody who works with with men male health. He may be like, oh, how's your sex life? Not good. Here's some Viagra. This will help you out. Maybe that's what's going on. Or what if he goes to a hormone specialist? Well, a hormone specialist, will be like, oh, your testosterone's low. Mm -hmm. that's the issue that we need. So you see that they're, that they're, they're coming at it from, it's like when you're, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, mm -hmm. but that's not the responsibility. And it can't be the responsibility until we figure out how to integrate everything of that one person. That's the responsibility of the consumer. It I, is the responsibility of the consumer, but it sucks because a lot of people don't get all that. Totally. Yeah. And they're going to this so expert or this specialist that has gone to school for eight plus years totally. to tell them and help them. And when they're they're not going to tell them that it, it you know like you said when they're you know when they're a hammer everything looks like a nail they're not going to tell them that it could be this other thing they're going to try and solve it with the tools that they have which is unfortunate because even if their tools can potentially help them temporary and that's the other thing that's is that sucks is that sometimes these temporary fixes make people and clients think that's the answer yeah like how many clients have you had who get like. A, a shot for a cortisone pain. shot yeah cortisone oh. shot and they're like oh my god that it was amazing yeah. it yeah. worked it worked so well and so no more pain that then they just they just keep doing that and keep doing it because nothing made them feel better than doing that and so in their head that is the answer i've had many clients like that and like trying to talk them out of doing that was so difficult because they felt the relief Dude, from i that. had a, yeah. i had an in-law who had some some wrist tightness yeah and went to the doctor, or whatever, and they're like, "Oh, uh, carpal tunnel. We need to do this the surgery. It'll fix it. The surgery's gonna fix." And they explain like what's going on and how the surgery's gonna fix it. And I thankfully convinced her. I said, "Give me one month. I don't know if it'll help. I think I have some ideas, but give me a month. What's the worst that could happen? At the very least, you'll get stronger and you'll have a better, you'll have a higher chance of success with surgery." Okay, gone. Carpal tunnel was gone. What did I do? Well, I looked at her wrist, but then I looked at her shoulder. There was tightness coming from her shoulder. She got some correctional massage, do some exercises, and it was gone. And a month later, she was like, I can't believe I almost got surgery. And I said, well, I mean, you didn't know any better, but thankfully you said, let's give this an opportunity. Now, we're talking about the kind of these extreme examples, but for the average person, the, 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 the best application I can think of is if there's things that you can't do that the average person should be able to do, what should we able to be able to do? We should be able to you know, do a light run. We should be able to climb. We should be able to squat and deadlift and rotate and press and row. We should have decent energy throughout the day. We should have normal sleep when we go to bed. Like we shouldn't have heartburn all the time and digest. Like these things that we treat as symptoms all the time. Like look at the root cause. You'd be surprised at how different your life could be if you just if you just spent a little time and took that kind of responsibility. Otherwise, you're literally putting your health in someone else's hands. Yeah. And then you're in this really bad uh, situation where, and I, I, you know, these are extreme cases, but I have some horror stories, man, of, of clients who they, they were put on one medication after another. Mm -hmm. And then those medication caused so many other problems. Oh, yeah. And then they later on got so fed up. I'm talking like a decade later, got so fed up that they finally went out, you know, went and figured out the root cause, which took them a little while. And they were like, dude, I wasted a decade of my life. 
mm-hmm. doing all these things when I didn't really have the issues that you know that that I, that, I, that required all these medications. Do you think really there's a lot of it is because there's just not a lot of money in it? Yeah, because a lot of these things are like stuff that people could do on their own. I mean, it's so much easier to throw like you know. You, God, I remember the first the first time my uh, my uncle stayed at my house. And I came in, uh, came in my guest bathroom and literally across my entire oh. sink counter. I mean, there must have been 30 bottles. And he's not, I mean, he's in his late, uh, mid to late 50s at this time. Um, and it was just like, I remember going like, holy shit. Like, what is, oh, that's for this. And then because I take that, I have to take this. Yeah. And because I take this, I have to take that. And because I take that, I have to take this. <laughs> it's yeah. like, You're oh, just it's a like, walking pharmacy. Yeah, it's like one thing he's trying to solve, but the one thing he solves, he has to take something else and then he gets an adverse effect from that. So he has to take that Dude, to counter that. So I had, oh I remember God. the first time I encountered that I had, because I used to always, you know, when, when you have a client or you get a client, you, you want to ask them questions. You have to, you know, you have to give, there's like, a, okay, I need you to disclose any medications I need to know about. Because for example, if someone's on a beta blocker, their heart rate isn't going to measure like someone else's. And so you could train them too hard and not realize it because the heart rate's not going up. Why? Because the beta blocker. So that's just one example. So I had this woman come and she was in her sixties and she brought, and she wasn't well, right? She was sick, unhealthy, the whole thing. She brought me a packet. It was like four pages of medications. And I looked at them and I said, okay, there's a lot here that I I'm not familiar with. Some of these I know because I, I understand as a trainer. A lot of these I don't. Do you mind if I call your doctor and ask questions? And she said, oh, yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that. So I did. I called the doctor, got on the phone, and it was, it was literally what you said. Oh, she's on. So this medication can cause anxiety. So then she'll take this, which is an anti-anxiety medication. And then because she's on this one, she gets constipated. So we also have her on this, which uh, helps her have regular bowel movements. And I was like, I, I literally went through and I went, oh my God, half of these are counted side effects of the other half. This is yeah. crazy. Dude, you just reminded me of something. Doug, maybe you could fact check me on this so I, so I get my numbers right. But I heard that 73 or 75% of all advertising money spent in, in the US is, is pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical drugs. Really? Yeah. Set like seventy something percent, was, and you don't think there's a bias that's there? That's fucking crazy. Yeah, that's insane. That's a lot of money, dude. Yeah, dude. that's a lot of money. That's insane. That's insane. Well, when you, when you think about it, it's, it's competing against all markets, like it, every it, other market, and it takes up three quarters. I, I'm pretty sure that's the number. Yeah, seventy five percent. Seventy five percent of all advertising money is pharmaceutical okay, so, drugs. So let's, that is let's, gangster. Let's go down that because that's a great statistic that I think highlights uh, a few things. So one, here's what I want to do. I want to take- blew my mind. I want to take out, wow, that's four, in 2024.5 billion dollars. Holy cow. What's crazy about that Brought is like, you're talking about Pfizer. one industry competing with all other industries. I know. That's insane. Know. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to watch this. Let's go down this, this, this rabbit hole for a second, but let's cut out nefarious intent. So let's just assume that nobody is purposefully lying or corrupt or trying to get you to buy their shit by by scaring oh. you. Let's just imagine. We'll live in fairy tale land. Let, well, let's <laughs> like just, this. you're right, because humans are humans, right? So And people are, are imperfect. But let's just pretend intentions are 100% pure and good. Okay. Here's why this is still a, a, a challenge and why we need to contend with this, because this is what drives the narrative. So what I mean by that is if you look at the fitness space, the supplement part of the fitness space is one of the most profitable parts of the fitness space. It's yeah. a fact. If you do the math, you look at all the stuff that, you know, all the money you yeah. can make. Inevitably, most people will end up promoting no, you're because a great, that's where you make money. No, you're, that's a great point. And you could probably carve out the fitness space. If you looked at all advertising money that's related to fitness, I would, I'd be willing to bet that 75 plus yes. percent is all supplements. Yes. So, because yeah. okay. So, so that's a huge, that's a, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, we, I think we agree, source of revenue. So what happens, again, let's imagine there's no nefarious intent. That drives the narrative. So now what happens is the content that's produced, the discussions that are had, revolve around these revenue-producing um, topics. So you are led to believe as a consumer, maybe not on purpose. Again, let's pretend everybody's got good intent. You are led to believe that the most impactful thing you could do for your fitness and health is take a supplement. Yeah. That's what you're led to believe. I believed it as a kid. Why? Because it drove all the content. So like when you look at medications, for example, when you look at blood markers that can predict you know, like poor health, right? 
one marker is total cholesterol. Now, total cholesterol by itself, unless it's extreme, and I'm not, this isn't just, hey, trainer Sal's and always talking about, this is a fact, unless it's crazy extreme, okay? But if it's like outside of what we consider to be healthy within a certain reasonable amount, it doesn't mean much unless you combine it with other uh, factors. So if we look at it and then we look at triglycerides and then we look at HDL, then we look at LDL, then we look at inflammatory markers, BMI, then you get a clear picture. But by itself, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean a whole lot. Like if your total cholesterol is above 200, which they say is the threshold, right? Let's say you're at 247, but everything else is perfect. Number the, the data will show that it probably doesn't mean much. Nonetheless, we are led to believe, or we have been for a long time, that total cholesterol is really important. Why? We have medications that 100% will lower your cholesterol. Down. Yeah, well, we, we have statins. Statins will 100% lower your cholesterol. Yeah. So the narrative goes in that direction. Which right? means so do all the studies and stuff like that to prove that. that because point. all the funding. Yes. Because the funding goes in that direction, right? So, and then- We this get is rid a, of all the nuance that to, way. The, and, and funding moves, and here's the thing too about getting you know things approved, is it's very hard to get money for things that are alternative or novel because it's untested. So like it would be easier for me to get funding for a brand new form of chemotherapy than it would be for me to get this like real novel, interesting, weird way to treat cancer that nobody's ever heard of. People will be like, investors are going to be like, I don't want to fund that because there's no track record. It's super risky. The odds are going to fail. Oh, a new chemo. Well, chemo is established. It's got some application. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, let me look and see what kind of chemo you know that you have. So it's just, even if you take out the, the malintent, uh, it just drives the narrative. So as a consumer, you have to understand that and know like, wait, why do I... Why is ten, nine out of 10 articles I read on weight loss talk about weight loss supplements and not about behaviors? Right. Okay. It's not because weight loss supplements are more effective because they're not. It's, it's got, just- You got to move product. That's the that's the narrative. So that's right. why, that's what I mean by that. That's why, I mean, shit. I don't know. How long did you guys think supplements were the key? I, I, I think, oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it was in every magazine. It was in every, you know- Whatever TV show I was watching about fitness, like it was always like right next to it. Well, it feeds into our psychology too. We want the the easy path, of course, right? We want the quick fix, and so it also feeds into our psychology. So it's a it's like a double down situation. It here. totally does, and I'll use even an, a, a you know kind of slightly related because um, it's another good topic. Slightly related point of this is that we with exercise. We value the the sweat, the burn, the soreness, and the effort more than the adaptations, more than the improvements, more than uh, the the skill acquisition. Mm -hmm. In fact, nobody talks about exercise from a skill acquisition standpoint. Nobody comes to you and says, unless they're experienced and they've been working out for a while. No new person works out and goes, "Hey, man." You know, how's your workout going? Oh, you have, this is crazy, but. I got great squats I, now. I'm way better. I'm way better at lunging. <laughs> yeah. Nobody says, oh, I lost five pounds or yeah. oh, I got so sore. I'm really sweating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, the truth is if you focused on skill acquisition, you get way better results totally. than if you focused on the other stuff. That was like the effort and the soreness and the sweat. Well, yeah. it's interesting too, because we'll take things like inflammation and demonize it so much because, you know, this is something that if we lower inflammation completely, you're going to be so much healthier no. when it's actually part of the process of adapting and building muscle. Which is, you know, and so it's, that's the thing. There's just so many little nuanced things that, uh, you know, the body has as signals and has as, you know, and pain's another one of those things. Like we can't get, you know, different pain. It's hard to like parse out like what type of pain. I, I, re is. I remember when we first uh, met our friend Jason Phillips, this is one of the things that really attracted us to his company and what they were doing was communicating this to the clients. Yeah. I felt like there's not a lot of, coaches and leaders in the space that are teaching others on how to communicate this information like to a client. It's always like, here's the problem, here's the band-aid to fix it versus, okay, let's dive into the behavior stuff. Let's dive into- Totally. Like Boom. What's up, everybody? Welcome back. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but we have another channel we just started called Mind Pump Clips. So if you just want like three to five minute clips of us saying really cool, fun, smart things, things that you could share, things that you can reference- Go to Mind Pump Clips and subscribe and turn on notifications on that channel. It's awesome and it's exploding. Also, here's the giveaway for today's episode, MAPS Anabolic, the program that started it all. I'm going to give away for free. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. 
Turn on notifications, do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section that you won a free program. Also, we got a sale going on right now. Check this out. If you go to mapsaugust.com, on there is something like, I don't know, 10 or 12 bundles, meaning we've taken two or three programs, put them together, ones that work really well together, and then we discounted the hell out of them. Okay, so each bundle, which is like I said, two to three programs, is only $99.99. That's the price of one program. So in other words, you could buy one program and get one or two for free with all these different bundles. So go to mapsaugust.com and find the one that works for you. Are you interested in fat loss or bodybuilding or strength or athletic performance or mobility? doesn't matter. We've put together bundles for every single person we can think of. And again, we've priced all of them the same, $99.99 for each and every bundle. Again, it's at mapsaugust.com. All right, here comes the show. There's a lot of good companies out there, but they're, that's why we chose them. You know, what I like about what I think they're doing right is, and I, we said this actually, I remember when we first started MindPump, we talked about certifications and they're all great when you learn the information, but the most valuable thing a coach or trainer could get is when they work, when they get mentorship, mm -hmm. like when they work under another good experience, because that's how you gain wisdom faster. They could watch the other coach. Oh, that's what you say. And that's how you say it. And that's how they responded. And wow, I could see their energy. And NCI offers that uh, with their coaching side. Yeah. That's basically what it is, is you're getting, you're getting good information. And dare I say, a lot of the information you're getting, you could probably find on your own. But the difference is you have this mentorship that they include where you're working with them. So the same way a trainer mentors a client and does a good job, they have that mentorship side where they have other coaches who are successful mentoring new coaches or coaches who want to become successful and that's why they're so they do such a damn good job. Do you see the massive giveaway they're doing for our audience right now? What? Yeah, Jason called me a couple of weeks ago and asked uh, what I'd be willing to do as far as on our side. Um, and we're gonna do the all like all maps programs, everything we ever created. It's like I don't know, I total. I think Doug totaled it all up. It was like two thousand something dollars worth of programs. Oh, he just pulled it up to add to it. Oh wow! Look at that. So this is a giveaway that you can enter into. Yeah, thirty-eight thousand dollars. So they're going to give you. Let me see if I'm reading this right. If an iPad Pro filled with all of their certification and master classes, which is like tens of thousands of dollars, you get coaching mastery, which that's part of what I just said. Um, which is the it's designed to make you ten thousand dollars a month in thirty days or less. No, that's their business. Then they have the business accelerator program. Yeah, that's what. That's a, yep. Yep, that's it. And then and then on top of it, you get every single MAPS uh, program. So when you win all that, you're essentially like you're getting the top, top you're line. world-class trainer immediately. Yeah. I thought that was a really clever idea. How cool is that? Like you just get the iPad and it's already loaded. Yeah, it's so all smart. Loaded all up, loaded with all that stuff. We'll that's be able to cool. do the same thing with, that's the, so smart. with the program. That's you know, it's a lot of cool stuff. Back to the exercise practice thing. I did this yesterday. So I came in to work out. I had, I got here early. So I had like a lot of time. And all I did was... Uh, practice exercises the whole workout. What I mean by that is I did like, I did box squats and I must've done 10 sets of box squats. And each one was like, how perfect can I make this? How good can the descent be? Mm -hmm. So the intensity was like moderate at, at most. I did it with bench press and then I did it with uh, pull-ups and overhead presses. And I, man, I always feel the best when I do that. My body yeah. just feels really, really good. And it's like, I can tell that it, it, it does me, you know, it does me good just to practice. Something. Yeah, I was doing similar like thought process, but mainly like what what I could I could do to move my body more effectively. And so in terms of like selecting exercise a little bit more on the functional side, I kind of came back to to that kind of world because now I'm like trying to coach kids like how to move and like how to like really pay attention to like their footing and you know being in the balls of their foot and then having that balance and then also being able to rotate and maintain balance and so um you know i started to incorporate a lot more things uh, for my shoulders for rotational purposes and then also like um, you know, stuff with the cables too, where I'm doing chops and things where I'm doing anti-rotational moves and I'm just controlling my body a little bit more effectively. So if I'm demonstrating it, I'm not like, eh, eh, <laughs> yeah. you know, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. I, uh, I've just started to add back a little bit of plyos into my routine just because, Oh, what do you start with? I uh, just jump boxes, just some basic stuff. And what inspired it was when Justin and I were helping my nephew out you know, watching him try and organize his body yeah. to just to do a jump box and see how challenging it was. And I couldn't even, you know, it's actually been years since I taught that, right. That I actually told sat and like showed that and then gave tips on that. And, uh, 
you know, it was, it was interesting to walk up to the box and then just like try and do it. And, and there was, a, it actually took me a moment to like kind of organize my body to do it really properly and stuff like that. I still got it. You know what I'm saying? I still have the ability to do it and coach it really well. But I actually, just the, the fact that I, it wasn't just like second nature to me, which I think 10 years ago, you, I wouldn't even have to think about it. And yeah, it just, just it, intuitive. Yeah. And I, I've lost that intuitive side to it. I have to kind of think about it. Isn't that it. funny like, how the body does that? Oh, it, yeah. Just to be efficient, it literally gets rid of what you think you don't need. And the way it judges it is, well, you haven't used this in a while. Yeah. yeah. So let's just get rid of this, you know? That's why I think it's so important to judge, no matter what your goal. Like, I have no goal of, you know, dunking a basketball right now or jumping super high or like that. But I don't want to lose that skill. So just making sure that I intermittently build it into some of my routines where I just kind of practice it for a little while, get back to doing it well, and then I'm cool. I don't need I don't need to like increase my vert like crazy or get really, really good at it. I just want to be able to do it and not lose that skill. Dude, I saw my like my grandmother, um, she went from, you know, walking to using a walker. And I knew the minute she started using a walker that her ability to walk without the walker would decline very rapidly. That's exactly what happened. Like, mm. like as soon as she started using the walker, because she stopped practicing without it, mm -hmm. she lost the ability to walk without it very, very quickly. Yeah. I used to see that with clients. Like, and, and it's they a would- rapid decline, yeah. Yeah, in fact, uh, I'm so fortunate to have worked with such a good physical therapist. I had a therapist in my uh, in my studio and she was so good. And she, she would always, she would have all these clients that would come in, patients who were older, and she would- to the best of her ability, be like, we are. We will only use a cane or a walker if absolutely necessary. I'm going to do everything I can to prevent you from having to rely on this or use this because the minute you use this, you're gonna you're gonna lose the other. I mean, she used to tell people this, and I remember as a trainer at first being like, but just let them use the thing; it's easier. And she'd explain yeah. it to me. She goes, "So, Sal, watch. The second they start using this, they lose that ability right away." And that's exactly. Do you what know happened. what's what study would you reference to? to explain that to a client. Like I, I remember I read a study one time that talked about how quick atrophy sets in. Would it be the same thing? Like atrophy setting in is about the same thing as you losing a skill like that. God, that's a good one. I would look like, at well, yeah. Cause there, okay. So the, the atrophy stuff is like, I believe it's 72 hours after the body has fully recovered from, from something being stimulated. Yeah. Right. So basically within a week or so of stimulating a muscle, it's already beginning atrophy. It doesn't God. mean like completely losing. I wonder it. if you could look up like hmm. skill um, skill loss versus skill acquisition. And of course there's always a genetic invariance, right? There's going to be yeah. people Age that- Age plays a role. Right. All those things yeah. play a role, but it'd be really interesting to see what we have out there research-wise to show like if you stop doing this movement, right? Let's say, let's take like overhead, like how often you guys have a client that yeah. you had- that you get them and they're in their even their late forties and early fifties yeah. and they already have lost the skill to be able to do. But that's just because there's very few things in life that really requires you to like get yeah, full yeah. extension. Yeah. I wonder I what mean, the even, average is time length of that that decline. Me too. Know? That's why yeah. I'm that's why I'm looking for like like You know the, what it is? It's like you start you start having challenges and then everybody else is like, I'll get that for you. Yeah. Next thing you know, you stop doing it. Or I mean, just again, I yeah. mean when you even okay, what's the only thing that comes to mind when I think of someone like getting full overhead extension? the closest thing to that is like putting dishes away yeah like what yeah, else but who, who has uh, who, who does that that high right? yeah yeah rarely ever so it's like what what move daily movement was somebody have to like dude, get it, full full extension dude, to make it? to even yeah. be even more weird right i i grew up i had there's a, a bunch of us male cousins that grew up all around the same age so our dads are cousins they all had kids the same so i grew up with all these all these guys we're all best friends or whatever when we when i was 14 uh three of my cousins moved to Italy. So they went back to Italy. So they grew up here, born, raised. They're 14, moved to Italy. Two of them came back. One of them stayed there. I remember going there. I was, I want to say my mid twenties and I hadn't seen my cousin since we were 14. And he spoke English. Like it wasn't his, 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 like he spoke, he spoke English still, but it wasn't like he spoke it when he was here. He had, it's like he had forgot almost or his brain. Oh, wow wasn't speaking at the way. And I remember him talking and, and kind of like struggling a little bit and mm. he could communicate no problem, but it wasn't like it was when he left. I'm mm. like, holy cow, that was 10 years. And it's because he didn't practice. He didn't practice speaking English, even yeah. though he grew up with it. Now there's a certain amount of, of skill that becomes permanent, I think. Like they say, you never forget how to ride a bike. Like that's true. I think you'll always remember how to ride a bike. Well, not always, but for most of your life. But you ain't going to remember how to ride it like you did the day you stopped. Yeah. 
You know what I mean? Like if you could ride a bike, go on a wheelie, all that stuff, yeah, you it still degrades a bit. Yeah, yeah, like I like I can get on a bike and still balance, but could I get on a bike and bunny hop like I did when I was fourteen? I don't know. I don't think so. That's well, interesting. I, I, the bike the analogy is a, is a is not a great analogy in my opinion because of because the physicality. Yes, because sure. of the physicality of in the position sure, you are. Sure, it's sure. very basic, right? I, like that's why I like using like the over like just reaching over your head yeah. should be very fundamental and basic and it doesn't require any real major skills but how quickly the body prunes that yeah. because you just have stopped doing it for a decade or two decades or whatever it is it's one of the first things I would address with clients coming in especially older clients yeah you know because it is such a rapid skill you lose like, I I see this now in kids with and I wonder if you see this with the sport with sports right now Justin is kids not breaking 90 degrees oh. being able to get down mm -hmm. like the ability to sit down in like a catcher's position or what that without their heels being raised up off the ground which even i know catchers have their heels off the ground but yeah. you know what i mean being yeah, able to yeah. get that deep i remember seeing my nephew who at the time i think he was only like it's actually same nephew who's coming in here and working out i remember him losing that skill like at 10 years old like 10 years old he couldn't even get all the way down ask the grass well when do they practice it right exactly you know yeah, it's I, just not a thing that like it and i remember doing that just like kind of waiting around i think the thing now is we never wait around we're never bored we never have <laughs> like we're always sitting down or we're doing something standing and it's like you know to sit in a squat and kind of wait and your turn or what i used to do that all the time like i was very comfortable just sitting in, in a squat and kind of just maintaining it it's, it's just so i was having a discussion this morning with my uncle about this is the younger generation right this is what happens when you get older you start having conversations about the younger generation and oh they don't do this and they can't do that and then i brought up the study about grip strength and you know like college age males today have the grip strength of 60 year old men in the 1980s and that kind of stuff yeah and then we're going back and forth and he goes you know he goes the truth be told he goes this is just a ever evolving trend he goes like, you know, we think we're badasses compared to the younger generation with certain things, but like compared to our dads and our grandparents mm -hmm. that go back six generations. So it's just, uh, I guess we evolve and in, in the sense that we just don't do the same stuff. Like, like I don't swing a hand. I didn't swing a hammer nearly as much as my dad. So you put a hammer in my hand and you have me swing it for an hour and I'm dead. Like my hand yeah. is hurting, whatever. You put a hammer in my kid's hand, he's dead after five seconds, right? Because I did more. So it's like, it's this interest. Well, there's, 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 there's the irony is like our body, like it it needs that kind of physicality. It's still yeah. not like we're not made to to sit and like have everything done for us. Like that's just not how the body thrives. Yep. And so we have to now uh, engineer ways for us to be stimulated like that. Uh, but we're trying to figure out like a way to get all those results without all the Dude, struggle. Well, it's not always bad though either, right? Like it's some some things like it's good that you that it gets pruned off so you can put energy and resources. Sure somewhere else yes, right yes because as as we evolve and there's there's like some you know stuff that we did 100 200 years ago that it will never be necessary again like why do you even want to waste any time with that skill set yeah. because we've evolved beyond that yeah it would be like saying like why do you put your your clothes in a washing machine why don't you go scrub right. them on a rock right right and then also making fun of you because you can't do that it's yeah. like well you're never gonna have to Bro, do that. you guys should have seen when i got so i got my dad i told you guys i got him a membership at the club sport where i go work out right and we're going in the functional area you know with the grass and everything yeah, yeah. and i'm showing him and he's like what do you do here what do you do there and i'm showing him and then i showed him the they have the big tractor tire you know that people will flip yeah and a sledgehammer mm -hmm. and he goes why is there a sledgehammer here and i said oh it's it's an exercise and they showed him you swing the hammer and he goes hold on a second he goes <laughs> yeah he goes, people come in here and swing a sledgehammer to exercise? It's, it's like embarrassing, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? Like, you know, <laughs> he's like, what are you, why are you doing that every right. single day? Yeah. Yeah. That's what we do he's like, work. you know you can go get paid for that, yeah, right? Yeah, it's like, he's like, what I are got you a do? job for you. He yeah. was making jokes. So what's the next gym going to look like? Uh, build this wall, yes. build this house, like, you know, Take lay down these, these bricks and move them over here. <laughs> yeah, dude. You know, like all that stuff. Yeah. No, it's, it's funny because it, it did spur a good conversation that I had actually with the whole family about obesity. And I said, you know, uh, obesity, modern standards, like what we, what we see now, you go back 150 years, it was non-existent. I mean, to the point where you can find pictures online and I've brought this up on the show before, because I think it's such a good example. You could find pictures of so circuses at, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. They used to have animals. They used to, and they also used to have what they called a freak show, right? And the freak show were human oddities. So it's like the bearded woman or, 
you know, the, the you know, uh, lobster claw kid or it was, it was, it was cruel and whatever, mm -hmm. but people paid to see these oddities. And there was always a circus fat man or a circ circus fat woman. Yeah. yeah. If you look up a picture of a circus fat man at the, in the late 1800s, they would not, and remember people paid money to see these people. That's how rare and weird it was. Yeah. You're going to go to Disneyland now. Yeah. Disneyland, go outside. Go oh, to yeah. Walmart. Like uh. walk this guy walking around outside wouldn't even nobody would even turn their head to look at him. And I told my my I was like I said I had this discussion with my some of my family and I said our gen, our genes didn't change that fast. What changed was our environment. So th the yeah. challenges we have today are the result of this radically different environment that our bodies just didn't evolve to live in. Yeah. yeah, you combine processed foods with the fact that we've evolved past doing a lot of this physical labor stuff. It's funny because I'm wrestling with this thing right now that I just uh, experienced this last weekend. I, You guys know, uh, of all of us, I'm probably the most notorious to like farm out work and not do it and sure. pay, pay someone else, right? I mean, that's like- Which is actually smart. Right, because yeah. of getting my time, right? Yes. Time is very valuable to me and it's like, oh, clean my house for- two or three hours or go do something with my son or what like that. Like that's, yeah. I'd you know, rather pay for someone to do that. But actually something that we did this weekend, we, and it was, it wasn't planned. We were just out, we were outside. It was a beautiful day. And we probably every about six months, we get like really fast weeds that grow in our backyard. We have a very, really big backyard and it's a, it takes several hours to do it. And so I, I pay a few hundred dollars for somebody to do that. Uh, which again, I'm getting my time and yeah. it's like, I don't want to do that. And it's not that hard to labor. It's just bending over and picking up weeds for hours. Right. But I was out there anyways. And I, you know, so I threw some gloves on and started grabbing it and Max was into it. Mm -hmm. We actually mm -hmm. ended up doing the entire yard. Oh, it's because you yeah. do it with your son. Yeah. 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 And it was like this whole thing. And so I, this is where the value is with that. Right? You're right. Yeah. And I, and I actually kind of had a, like this moment of checking myself because I'm quick to always do that. In fact, mm -hmm. I'm the one, Katrina always, Katrina's like, oh, we got to get the yard. I'll oh, pay someone. Yeah. I'll just pay someone to get it done like that. And I've, we already done this like four times already where I've paid, I think three to $500 to have this done. And now I'm, I do, I did it last time with my son all this, this weekend. And we had this great experience totally. pulling the weeds and it made me go, Oh man, maybe I should, I should put my brakes a little bit sometimes where I'm so quick to farm it out, especially yeah. at least where he's at right now. He's so yes. excited to do physical totally. things with me. And I'm also thinking like that. I didn't work out that day. That ended up being my workout. Like, yeah. Two and a half, three hours of like pulling weeds. Like I was hot and sweating. It's like it was physical for me. And it's like, man, we're we're so quick to farm this out and not do these things when there was some serious value there that I gained that I would have probably dismissed in the past. And now it has me kind of reevaluating totally. yeah, some of those I've, things. See, I've come from the opposite end of that spectrum, and and um, that's you know what has been ingrained in my own brain and be able to see that. Uh, involvement with the kids, like seeing you do the hard work and labor and they want to help and like get involved. And I'm like, oh, this is so great, you know? And so I would like try and do all these projects and things involving them. And then I would just get frustrated and, <laughs> and you know, and we'd kind of struggle together and I'm like, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And so um, I finally gotten better at it in terms of like hiring out some of the really like stupid work that yeah. I'm just like, you know, I'm just going to be swearing and all. I don't want my kids, you know, yeah, <laughs> to, right. to, it's to a be bad there with so that. That it's point. a bad lesson, right? I'm showing a bad example, but you know, I'm finding projects I can do like that where we're still, we got to grind through it. We got to work together. And it's not like there's not this super urgency and you know, towards it. So I can right. take my That's time. Such good awareness. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's everybody knows holding the flashlight for your dad. Like, no, you, oh, you better not move the flashlight. Yeah, yeah. The wrong exactly. Way, cause I, cause that's how I grew up. Right. Yeah. And like, if I did something wrong, it what's was that, like, what's that movie, uh, a Christmas story where he's, he's holding the, the, the lug nuts for his dad while he's changing the tire. Uh -huh. And then he drops them and he looks at his dad and he's like, <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. And he yeah. gets a big ass yeah. Yeah. for yeah. saying the F word. No, that's a good point, Justin, because that that obviously that's what made it, it was very easy, but just kind of time consuming work. Yeah. It was easy enough that he could engage with me, right? Totally. Like I put this little glove on him and he's like pulling the weeds and helping me carry dude, the bucket. Hundred like, percent. A hundred percent. Like I, I told you I've told this story before, but it's like I'm like, oh, I gotta hurry up and do the dishes so I could play with Aurelius. And then Jessica's like, have him help you with the dishes and make it fun. And yeah, it'll take much longer, but now you know what, you, you don't have to think of what to do to play with him. 
I'm like, oh my God, oh, you're Katrina, brilliant. Katrina came. Mm-hmm. She was she was texting me on the way home on Sunday and she was coming in a little bit later than what she thought. And I was like, oh, do you want to go catch a movie with Max because you missed out on that experience? And she's like, oh, she's like, I got to come home. I got to do start the laundry, this and that. I said, oh, we did all the laundry. She's like, what? You did all the laundry? I said, yeah, actually, it started with me. I, I needed something that I wanted washed personally, but then Max was so into it. Mm-hmm. And so we turned it like I literally it was and it was like this, you know, where I take one piece out, I hand to him. Yeah. He put it in it the Takes dryer. forever. Yeah. yeah, it took forever. <laughs> yeah. But it was like whatever. I would have been downstairs playing trucks with him or building a puzzle exactly. or doing something else. So I did something physical with him that he really enjoyed the process. And I think sometimes, you know, as, as parents, I know we can get it's caught. It's such up. a paradigm shift. It is. And you have to so you have to switch that mindset going into it of like, oh, I gotta get this chore done versus oh wow, he's really enjoying this and engaging in this. And so I actually took my time of like each one. It was like Dude. you know, to unload the washer and dryer took us like 30 minutes, you know. Say, Dude, thank God, because my wife was so good at that. I would have never noticed, I would have never even seen that. Now yeah. there's one downside though. The downside is if I do any chore or whatever that Aurelius typically helps with, I cannot do it without him now. Because if I go, if he hears me open the dryer, yeah. mm-hmm. he'll scream if I did the laundry without him now. Because he has to push <laughs> the button. He has, So I've actually done this where I put the stuff in. He he hears, he runs over because he'll be doing something he loves doing. He gets mad. I have to take everything out. And then, okay, can you help me please? Then we got to go <laughs> yeah. through and do the whole thing Okay, I'll, I'm going to kind of throw myself under the bus here. Maybe you guys as well. Um, but do you <laughs> throw yeah. yourself, bro? No. no, just me and everybody, every like men in general. <laughs> like, I me. know that like I'm not the only one that does this and has been guilty of this. I've gotten better at. I don't really care about it anymore, but like, it, there's certain things like so certain chores and you know we have certain roles and and so Courtney will do certain things, I'll do certain things, and then yeah. um she'll leave out of town or whatever, and like I'll just do all the things and no problem, right? Yeah. And I did that a few times. Whoa. You did all this? Like, it's like so surprised. And I'm like, dude, it's easy, you know, but <laughs> oh, no. like, I didn't want, I don't want to like expose that because now it's the ex- expectations are going to increase. Oh. Right. It's, uh, oh, you're see, like, so I'm okay. That's funny. You said this, cause this is a very similar thought. Like, cause I did everything right. And cause she, Katrina was like blown away by all that stuff like that. But I have this, like, there's a little competitive side to me. Like I don't have mom. Mom's not here. Yeah. So dad is gonna do all of mom's stuff and dad's stuff. That's kind yeah. of part and, of it. Yeah. And yeah. So she came home, not a fucking toy, not any, not a dish. Nothing. The whole house was clean. Weeds were done. Like everything was all yeah. done. And she was just like, "Oh my yeah, god." Yeah, but you know what? There's a difference between sprinting and then doing that shit every day. Of well, yeah, and no. dealing with the kids. Of and course, with the dogs. Of course, or whatever. of course. It's like, yeah. okay, yeah, good job, buddy. Gonna do that shit exactly. every day. Yeah, day, day it. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. So. What I find is when I do stuff is that when I start to become more like, okay, I'm going to handle this part or whatever, then I become the one that's like, hey, uh, you, put your, you put your fork in the sink. or And then Jessica laughs. Like, oh, now you give a shit about whether or not people leave stuff out. It's like, <laughs> yeah, because they just washed everything. Keep yeah. it clean, kids, you know? Because yeah, that's usually me. <laughs> I mean, I don't. I, I think it was just more of like a, a competitive thing of can I, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like that's I, I have that competitive side to me like yeah. from sport. It's like, you know, can I manage all this? Can I actually watch my watch my son and still be able to get all these things done? No doubt it's it's taxing. And mm-hmm. it would be crazy to do that day in, day out, every single day. And I know there's a yeah. lot of people. I that, think it's good too to be able to see like, you know, what that looks like, you know, and like do all those things. And so you get more perspective of like, you know, you come home, you talk about like and you know, some of those things that pop up, like, oh wow, I really should kind of pour more effort in here because that sucked. You yeah, know? and so I'll get a little, a little bit more insight and in, in, in more empathy, yeah. you know, towards some of those other tasks. The secret sauce, though, is one hundred percent what we're talking about, which is in, is including the kid. In yes, all of it, you yeah. know, yes. is recognizing that okay, it may slow down the process. And you can take all that time anyway. That's right. Yeah. It's like it, it's either because the way I looked at it was like when we were doing the laundry. It's like okay, yeah, that laundry that would normally only take me ten minutes to to do real quick ended up taking thirty to forty five minutes. But I would have neglected doing it so I could play the extra or rushed it and then played. That's anyway. what I mean. Mm-hmm. That's, and I'm like, instead, I'm like engaging him in that. And then, like, what you the point you made is like, I think it's good that he sees dad doing that. Bro, and, and it's so, so good. I'm it won't t- be weird when he's ten and I'm like, hey, help dad take the trash out. Oh, hey, help, help dad do this. It won't be listen, like, huh? Listen, yeah. I need you got. I am the extreme example of the opposite. I did nothing when yeah. I was a kid. Nothing. Yeah. Mom did everything. In my 20s, I had to learn how to do shit. Literally, I moved out because I, I bought shares of a club, a gym. So as in business, I was like, okay, responsible. I know what I'm doing. I moved out. 
I didn't know how to use a, wa- a, wa- a dishwasher. I didn't know how to wash my clothes. I had to ask my neighbor. I remember going to the grocery store and I'm looking for like detergent for clothes. I don't know what to buy. So I bought the powder, the liquid, the softener, the this, that. I bought all the stuff. I had no idea yeah. what the hell was going on. I put liquid <laughs> put, soap. Put dish soap in there. Right? In the dishwasher yeah. and made suds go out through the whole house. I had no, I had no idea. It Is it you, soap? You I didn't know you needed a bed frame. So I bought a mattress and then I had no bed frame. <laughs> so I'm like, oh yeah, wait, why is this on the floor? This doesn't uh, make any sense. You just so. reminded me of a funny, the last time we just, I, I just got back with the, when we had our vacation and I went to Truckee, right? With my, my really close friends and my buddy and I, um, we went grocery shopping instead of the wives and like, we're like, yeah, yeah, we, we'll run, we'll go run the grocery store. Right. And him and I go, and then like, I get the text and it was like, you know, him and I were under the impression we we're going to go grab like five things. And it was like a legit, <laughs> like groceries, but we were there for like four hours. Oh, wow. no. the, the two of us, like, it would like, where's this? We would be like, <laughs> like it was, that's, there's like a skill, dude. Hey, You're there, so, I hate dude. him. It's so true. <laughs> I know, dude. I get well, lost in there hey, sometimes. You know what it was like? It was like this. It was like, okay, we we we, we both, and we're trying to work as a team, which was awful, like, right? <laughs> so it's like, okay, we got to get uh, yeah. cucumbers and bread. So, okay, you go get cucumbers and get bread. And it would literally, we'd have to walk the whole place to yeah. get the one thing. Yeah. Bro. How many times have you yeah, guys ever dude. done this? I'm like, where have, am I right now? Have you guys ever done this where your your wife's like, get this, and you're at the grocery store, and then you literally text her and like, they don't have it. She's like, yes, they do. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, bro, the grocery store does not have cucumbers. Bro, we had I'm telling te- you right now. We had to te- yeah. text yes, them like does. three uh-huh. times. She's like, where, FaceTime where stuff was, <laughs> yeah. and we even got irritated. Like this, you know, it's so bad. We got irritated. I remember getting all frustrated. Like you could have organized the list where all the things were, to get- <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, yeah. who the fuck yeah. organizes a grocery yeah. list like that? Yeah. We don't take the time to actually go like, oh, this is over these aisles. Or not in yeah. the baking section. Yes. You know, I'm like, it's so pissed off. Yes. What is it doing I've, up front? I've literally done this where my wife's like, yeah, they have it. I'm like, no, this store is obviously out of it. I'm in this section. I'm looking right now. She'll yeah. like, FaceTime me. I'm like, no, that's embarrassing. Yeah. I'm not going to FaceTime. I've done that. I've I'm like, I'm not going to, you're not going to babysit me. She goes, Sal, just <laughs> face it. So I'll FaceTime her, turn the phone around. She'll be like, it's right there in the third row oh, on the th- and I look I'm like oh yeah it's right there bro. why am I not finding this embarrassingly true this is so terrible yes. anyway <laughs> anyway so speaking of uh, you know all these things require lots of energy okay so, so, <laughs> so yeah, here we transition. go here's my transition nice now. all these things require lots of energy I am weaning off caffeine again because I weaned off caffeine did a good job with it. And within a week, I was right back up. Yeah. So, and that's a very strong drug. When you start to go off caffeine, you start to realize just how addictive yeah. and powerful and amazing. I mean, literally, if caffeine got discovered today, it'd be the number one black market drug. That's my belief, hundred yeah. percent. So, anyway, was it ever black market? Not to take no. It it's been in human humans have used it forever. Oh, okay, yeah, even before they had regulations on stuff. But anyway, so I am weaning off back on the Organifi red juice. And I tell you what, man, if I go off caffeine without the red juice, I can't do it. I have to have the red juice because it does take the edge off quite Big a time. bit. Yeah. Quite a bit. Big time. It's not the same. Caffeine's its own it's thing. It's definitely not the same, but it does kind of keep your drive going throughout the rest oh, of the day. Otherwise, I, I bro, think, I, hate, I don't think it's just that. I actually think that it helps mitigate the adverse effects that, you get of being on the caffeine. Yeah, the, ha- the headaches, yes. the, the freaking uh, yes. irritability, yes. all that stuff. That's yeah, what I was I, talking to Adam. Like, There's a certain point where... Um, you get so high in your caffeine consumption where I'm just drinking it and then you go back to, to have another one because you're starting to get a lull and it makes you more tired. Yes. And yeah. this is like, I, I went through that. That's when I really like start to peel back and I, I don't get rid of it. I'm going to be very honest, but uh, uh, I do go down to like one to two cups at that point. Yeah, it's if the, I go too three, high. It's the three for me. Is once I three? start, yeah, once I start, and I normally will push to four before I like have the full awakening of like- I have it as a- Making me tired. I have, it on, I have a number. So it's- uh, 400 milligrams above that, uh, I got to go down. So I'll work my way up to 400 milligrams in a day. And when I start to go above that, what happens is I get the caffeine buzz and I crash hard, mm-hmm. hard. Yeah, yeah. And I'm irritable. I'll be yawning. I'll be like on third, on the third yeah. caffeine yes. drink. And I'm like, I yeah, hate that. So, and so yeah. the red juice has got rhodiola, it, which is a good adaptogen, other compounds. So what I'll do is I'll wean the caffeine off. Going the, and the red juice gives you energy. So if you don't even have caffeine, You'll feel energy from it's it. It's such above. a different energy, though, so it doesn't feel like yes. you're just replacing it with another caffeine. So drink. what it does for me is it takes away the irritability. It saved my life and the, last and time the, I And the, the crushing exhaustion. That When I come off caffeine, it's not like, oh, I'm tired, like I work too much uh, or I move too much. It's literally like I don't have, like someone turned off my batteries. 
Like, mm -hmm. what is wrong with me? You know, it's a main way that I use. Cause I, I mean, I think probably Organifi, I probably use their green juice the most, then maybe pure, give or take. Yeah. And then yeah, the red juice, that's how I use red juice. I mean, that's the, the main reason why I use it. 100%. I rarely ever use it for any other reason other than that, okay, I'm trying to come back down on ca off of caffeine, and it helps mitigate that. Awesome. All right, one last thing before we go, because uh, we'll switch over to questions here, but uh, this is just too cool not to share. Have you guys ever seen an elephant get CPR? That, is, <laughs> How does that work? Is dude? it possible? It you, is. You blow in his trunk. There was a, no, no. There was a video of this elephant, and the handlers are literally on the elephant on the carcass and jumping on it what? to give it the the CPR that it needs. And it obviously makes sense because it's such a big animal. How yeah. do you compress the heart, bro? There were three people having to synchronize their jumps and pumps to get the heart, to, and then they they saved it the worked. Animal. Yeah, it saved it. I would wow. think you would even need more than that. That's what it was. It was like three people, three full grown people standing on the, cause the elephant was on its side, standing on it and pushing on it and bouncing on it to give it CPR. Crazy. I didn't, I didn't know that was, who's blowing in his mouth? No, they don't do that part. It was just the, I don't think. <laughs> didn't they drop that in CPR? <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, they it's did. All, yeah. It's all compressions. It's, it's all compressions now, yeah. right? Yeah, no yeah, more yeah. breathing in the mouth at yeah, all. So huh? stop, you, you, know, you can stop faking passing out to get the, <laughs> the lifeguard to <laughs> make out with you. <laughs> Hey, check this out. There's a company we work with called Olipop. They make these drinks. They're like sodas, except they're extremely low in calories, like 30, 35 calories per can. Per can uh, and they are good for gut health. Those are your gut health sodas. They taste amazing. In fact, they taste like the sodas you grew up drinking as a kid, like uh, classic root beer or vintage cola, strawberry vanilla, orange squeeze, cherry vanilla. Uh, I mean, those are all my favorites, classic grape. Tastes amazing, low calorie, good for your gut, all natural. I recommend getting the variety pack so you can try them all out, see which one you like. And now you've got yourself a tasty, low calorie drink that's healthy for your gut. So go check them out. Head over to drinkolipop.com. That's d drink, O L I P O P.com forward slash mind pump, and you'll get 20% off plus free shipping. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Holly Wakelin. What are some common meals that are great for the family and hit all the healthy macros? Oh, that's a good question because, okay, let's let's paint the context here. You're cooking for your family. It's got to be healthy. It's got to be somewhat palatable because you got kids, so you're going to make some food that the kids aren't going to want to eat. And it's got to be somewhat easy because, uh, you know, who wants to spend two hours in the kitchen? So let's let's think of that. I mean, scenario. I actually all don't I have is rice, meat, and veggies. <laughs> that's all I got. I mean, I mean that's. I mean, that's. A, I mean, why not? But you know what? They yeah. go so far, though. I mean, like how you in, in exchange almost any meat in there. I mean, you could do so many that's different. It. Like we rotate from uh, veal, bison, turkey, um, chicken, fish, uh, beef, like, and all. So all, and even some pork, right? But not as much pork. I would say you guys do lamb uh, occasionally. Occasionally, yeah. Okay. Occasionally, we do lamb. Um, I'd say that, I mean, that's a, an eight rotation of, of meat and then it's getting paired with either rice, sweet potato or yams. And then our probably go-to greens are always either spinach, asparagus, um, Brussels sprouts. Yeah. yeah Brussels yeah. sprouts. Yeah. You know, I'd we do, we do bowls sometimes. So we'll actually make uh bowls like that where you've yeah. got the ground meat, you got the ground I beef. iron skillet that yeah. shit all exactly. up. Yeah. Ground beef. combo. You can do skewers is yes. the way we change it up sometimes, but like pretty much the same, like sort of rotational so, thing. So this is really easy, right? Yeah. You could get the variety mixed veggies that are frozen. By the way, frozen veggies, totally fine. In fact, in some cases higher in nutrients because they freeze them with peak nutrient. They last a long time. They're cheap. So you get those that kind of mixed veggies. You put that with rice and ground beef. You could throw a little bit of avocado on there or um, what, what's it called? The avocado dip. I can't remember. I, can't, I don't know why I can't think right now. Guacamole. Guacamole, Guacamole. on there. And you have like these bowls and the kids love it because you can, and if you want to make it even more fun, we've done that where we've made bowls and then given, gotten chips, corn chips. So the kids can, if they want to add corn chips to it and it's- I mean, we build, it, we build our dinners around- um, the meat, right? Yeah, so whatever, whatever is defrosted, and then we have ready, whether that, that be yeah. the chicken thighs or the ground beef or the veal or any of those things, and then you know, see, and I think uh, you season it up. You're, if you're eating whole foods, like go go to town, season it up however you like. We use a lot of Montreal. That's like a go to like seasoning that we use. Oh, that's the yeah, mm -hmm. the Montreal seasoning. It's yeah, good. it's I mean, it goes so well with so many. Different you know what things. else is pretty good? That's actually quite easy. Is uh, roasting a chi a whole chicken with potatoes and um, carrots. 
and you put it all in the same so we actually glass container we we buy so that's a very that's a staple easy fast go to meal um katrina always has a whole chicken in there from when you grab from safeway or costco mm -hmm. yeah the whole chickens she buys that and then just tears off of that. And it's then, the easiest way. It yeah, make, salads she makes it into salad. Yeah. She makes it into burrito stuff. She makes it into like burrito bowl type stuff. Yep. She makes a taco chicken taco salad out of it. Like, so that's part of, super part of, easy. Part of the family stuff that that I found success in is making it somewhat fun for the kids. So like you could do like a a, a taco night and you could choose. Regular taco shells, or you could get the grain-free ones that they now have that are actually pretty good. Cassava flour or whatever. Yeah, use cassava yeah. flour, or you could use, you know, corn. I, I stuff. And, I, and what we'll do is we'll have the stations out, yeah. and they'll include a vegetable. They'll include, obviously, a meat, and maybe a starch, like a rice, and maybe some cheese or whatever. And then the kids can go make their own, and they tend, because it's fun for the kids to make their own food, they tend to include everything and, and eat more. I, you know, the you parents know? I feel for is, is somebody who is – recently on their health and fitness journey and they already have kids that are like 10 you know and the they, kids don't get it well yeah why are we I, eating different now yeah man? that's what's real yeah. so that I, like if you have a if you have a family that you've raised your like i don't foresee max ever having like a problem eating he, he's been eating our food since he was yeah. born um we don't go crazy w with sauces and things like that he hasn't been introduced to a lot of these different foods and so i don't think it's and he eats everything that we eat so i don't see why it'll be that much of a challenge where i think it's challenging is if you raise kids on mcdonald's and pizza and, and fast food yeah they develop and, a palate that yes way, that way. and then you try and go like all right mom and dad are on a health kick yep you know we're having chicken thighs and rice for dinner and they're like huh yeah, yeah. what's up with that like so but i mean you always have a soda you know yeah every meal. so that i i think that's why we get questions like this because i think that's where it becomes challenging is when you are trying to make an easy go-to but also taste good meal for kids and you think like there's this like secret hack that one of us might have that's going to give you this recipe that kids are going to love. Well, listen, if your kids are seven, eight, nine, or 10 plus years old and they've been eating a lot of junk food, chips and shit yeah. like that, and then all of a sudden it's you want the wanna... same ingredients, just like repurposed, mixed around, you know, yeah. so it's kind of a different experience. I feel like Mexican food's the best for that. It's right? yeah. it's burrito. No, it's an enchilada. No, it's tacos. <laughs> no, it's a salad. No. And it's, it's like, always delicious. It's the same stuff. Yeah. And it's always amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think if you you center it around the meat, I think that's very smart. Yeah. Because you have your essentials there already, right? You have your essential nutrients, uh, both macro and micro. Yeah. So if the family eats the meat, they're gonna get the fats, the proteins, which are essential, plus all the healthy nutrients nutrients that meat has in high concentrations. Then you can add a vegetable, frozen vegetables, very easy. It's not, and I say frozen because, uh, it, they last long. One of, there's a big problem. A lot of people, I do this. If I buy fresh vegetables, I end up throwing away at least a quarter of them. You get them right away. You get them, right, but if it's frozen, I can take it out of the freezer yeah. and frozen vegetables are totally fine. Yeah. Totally. Healthy. Or you find yourself having to go to the grocery store two, three times a week. Yes. Right. And then rice and potatoes are very easy. And even mm -hmm. French fries that you could, there's, there are companies that make French fries that are frozen in a bag and you look at the oils they make them in. They're not bad and they're super easy. So if you have kids that are picky, like, oh God, what am I going to give them? They don't want to eat what... They make these, I don't remember the brand, but I buy some of them and they're really easy. You put them in a pan, you put them in the oven, throw yeah. some salt or and it's, air, it's air, air fryer. Air fryer ones yeah, are great for that. Everything's yeah. crispy. So, so, yeah, vegetables. Totally. We, we do a lot of air fryer, a lot of Instapot stuff too. We yeah. do a ton of stuff in the Instapot. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. But yeah, that's, I mean, that's what I do. I always think meat first. What's the, the starch that we'll throw in? Typically it's rice or potato, usually. And then what's the vegetable? And, uh, you know, that's, and that's it. And you can, like you said, Justin, Mix and match them and make them kind of simple. Um, and what Jessica does that's really good is she'll prep the food in the day when she has 10 to 15 minutes. So if we're going to have like a roasted chicken, it'll already have the butter and the seasoning on it and the sliced lemon and stuff. And then it's just ready to go. And then we just put it in the oven later on when it's time for dinner. I've also, and mm -hmm. th this is probably um, more recent than not, um, I'm okay too with like a, a, a big old ribeye steak and just spinach. Like, cause you, to your point about your meat, you're hitting so many of your, your macro and micronutrients just from that big old steak and then adding some green up there. Like there's this idea that we always have to have this big carb. Like we, you're right. meals are always built around these massive carbs. You're the one that showed me the, the easiest to sneak in there. You're the one that showed me the fruit dessert. That is a great way. If you want to throw some extra carbs, you buy some berries, wash them, put them in a bowl and they have coconut whip 
which if you, the calories and sugar in that is almost nothing. Yeah. You throw a coconut whip on there and kids, my kids freak out. They think it's the best thing in the world. And yeah. it's just, it's basically just fruit. Next question is from Samantha Lindsay one. Where do you guys turn to for programming ideas and to gain more knowledge regarding training? Oh, I will tell you right now. Not much now. Yeah, not, any, not anymore. But if you're a trainer or even if you're the average person, you want to figure out programming knowledge. I think obviously our show, I'll say our show is a great place. But if you're a trainer and you want to really take it to the next level, the competitive strength sports, yeah. in my experience, have the best information because... Not because they're, you know, weightlifting is superior than, you know, than other forms of lifting, or whatever, but rather because they're competitive, you have to, the proof has to be in the pudding. So they place a lot of emphasis on the programming. Like you well, see a lot of science in the programming yeah. behind Olympic that's just lifting. It. They have powerful. a lot of science back yes. stuff. Yeah. I actually don't think that's what makes our programming so special. I think what makes us unique is that we have read all the same science that some of the best, you know, programmers out there as far as like sports performance, I would say. Sure. I, I would agree with you. But the, what makes what we do so special is the decades of experience of training normal people. Of course, that we take in, we take into account the behavioral aspect of it and trying to get people to do something long term. And so there's times it actually when, works. That's right. Yes, there's there's certain th things in, that will program that will go like, okay, like this would be the most ideal thing. But the real the reality is a large portion of people won't do that or they'll 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 not be able to do that and they'll yeah. have to regress out of that exercise. So what's a good supplement for that? And so that's the type of stuff that I think that we do that's special in comparison to like somebody who write cuz I mean we're all 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 really good trainers that write really good programs are all reading the same studies. Yeah. yeah. They're all reading as far as periodization and understanding exercise order and that I mean that's all pretty basic stuff. The stuff that I think is the secret sauce to how we write stuff is we are going, I think we all, when we get in a room and we sit down and say, okay, this is going to be the adaptation, right? That we're, This is a, the mm -hmm. thing of the avatar we're trying to build this program for. We start throwing out all the, the movements and exercises and stuff that we want in there. And then we're all, I can see everyone's brain turning of like all the hundred plus clients that you train that fit that category and thinking of all the challenges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, oh yeah, I remember like so many of my clients, they struggled when we did this. And so this always helped those people. And then like the other guys yeah. will chime in and do the yeah. same thing. And that's not reading somebody else's studies or that's not no. reading somebody else's programs and then stealing from them and going, oh, this is so-and-so does this so well. It's like, we're all, we all read the same studies that break down like how to program well, it's the experience that I think is. A well, I think in terms of just ideas, I think we all have different interests and in like what kind of like led our careers individually. And so I think uh, we get inspired by certain people uh, that we know in the industry that, you know, we may follow, we may see a post, we may see something on Instagram or whatever that may spark something and then like kind of dive deep into that, like a Lane Norton post or for instance, or, you know, something like that where, you know, or, or it's a bodybuilder or something in that direction where like, oh, I haven't done that style of training in a really long time and I haven't incorporated that and then we'll experiment or something. For me, it's like, it's typically like unconventional type of lifts and like people I've seen like, you know, be able to tackle that as well as like, um, you know, uh, physical therapists and, and, and people trying to, to add in ways of uh, other techniques in terms of uh, applying um, therapy and mobility practice uh, for, for joints and, and function of that. And then uh, also sports performance, just because yes, it doesn't apply to your everyday average person, but sometimes there's gems in there. Like for, uh, you know, pain and, and certain specific limitations and range of motion for, you know, shoulder, for hips, whatever it is. Uh, and then I'm going to peer into that and just, you know, dive deep and like, wow, I really yeah. like that exercise. Oh. I, I could, I'm like banking all this stuff to then later on, it's like, oh, wow, this, this may make sense when we're all collectively trying to figure out what adaptation, what avatar uh, we're creating through well, this. Well, to me, the best example of what you're explaining right now is our RGB bundle. When you think about the way red maps anabolic maps performance and maps aesthetic came to be it's all three of our kind of passions of what we are really into like sal for sure is it talks all the time about strength right that's like and so maps anabolic is, is are the the core principles ar around building a solid strength program for the and for building a metabolism yep. for and, and Muscle building focus. with the, the most minimal amount of work with, and get the, the that is the most effective way to train 
that's what that is. Performance is your baby. Performance is literally the things that you've been passionate about, the things that you brought to the table that I think that you went down the rabbit hole of enjoying and applying and using. And so a lot of that was a lot of what we adopted for that program came from the things that you were passionate and reading. And then when you think of aesthetic, aesthetic is very much so mirrors the way I train my body getting ready to compete. So it's very, mm. you know, aesthetic focus, right? Building the physique. And so, and then all the rest of them is a, is a, a, a blend of our experience, the, the, the stuff that we've read. I mean, we've brought people in, right? Obviously when we did, um, uh, when we did strong, we brought Robert Oberson. When we did power lift, we brought Ben Pollock in. So we took our expertise. Amelia Boone for o o OCR. Yeah, Amelia Boone with OCR. So we took, you know, experts in those fields that, that that's all they live and breathe is that space. Mm -hmm. And we combined it with our experience and knowledge of training regular people. Yeah. And we thought, okay, how do we extract what we know from these guys and girls that is best for their sport? But then we take our practicality of knowing normal people and like how do we give and that's that's the blend i can tell you um the breakthroughs that i had in my understanding of programming i can really break it down for you like i remember like what I, initially my knowledge came from bodybuilders and what i learned from them were angles and the pump and how to feel individual muscles then i remember learning from power lifters what i learned from power lifters well uh you know feeling, uh, stressing the movement and biomechanics and efficiency. And that's when I learned about, you know, techniques like progressing the resistance with chains and mm -hmm. bands. I remember reading Soviet studies about weightlifters, right? Olympic weightlifters. What I learned from them, frequency and practice and all day practice of certain lifts. Um, I learned from a book called Dinosaur Training. I learned from a book called Heavy Duty. All these things influenced me very strongly. I worked with a physical therapist where I learned a ton from watching her work with, you know, therapy with you. And then the experience, like you're saying, Adam, of, okay, wh how, what, okay, this is great. This information's awesome. Does it really, is, is someone going to really do this? Are mm -hmm. they going to follow through? Are they going to feel when they do it? Like I could, for example, you know, swimming at 4 a.m. in a cold, frigid lake might be the most effective fat burning thing you could possibly do, but I know no one's going to do it. So I'll never promote it right. because you got to wake up at 4 a.m. and go swim in a cold lake type of deal. So that I think that there's, I mean, the, really the key is, especially if you're a trainer, is to stand on the shoulders of giants and to not close yourself off. Here's the one thing that I'll tell you that'll drive a trainer in the right direction or a fitness enthusiast in the right direction. Don't get stuck in a camp. Don't be the bodybuilder that's, that thinks they can't get any value out of gymnastics or, or weightlifting or kettlebell training or an endurance training. Like there's pieces in all of these things that you can learn from and you want to be you want to be the big mixed martial artist you want to be the one that understands that okay there's value in all these things what can i learn from them and that's i mean that's to, what happens to that, after years to that and years. point i i would recommend people or trainers specifically looking for experts in very specific niche areas that you can learn from and then taking from all of them. Totally. Like, yeah. like one of the you things that I always, I always get annoyed it. about that we get, we always get people that like, and I won't roll anybody under the bus as far as names. Cause it's not, this isn't, I'm not saying this is a slide. It's more like people just don't get it right. They we will get someone who's like a, that wants us to interview like some, you know, big YouTube kid who's like talks about programming and he's a smart kid. And there's like, Oh, why don't you guys interview him? Or what do you think? And then they, and they want to compare like, their programming with that. It's like, listen, I, the, the kid has got good stuff. Like he's all the studies that he's referencing that he's done it. We've read all those same studies, but the reason why I think it's silly is because it's like, we've already taken all that information. We're also taking from all these other brilliant experts and we've combined all that to come to right. this place where we're currently at. So when you introduce me to somebody who's like, you know, Especially 20, a young kid. Yeah, somebody yeah. 28 years old. Yeah, and it's like, and they're on. smart. They read the, all the studies and they understand the science really well. And they've put out good content. It's just like, uh, there's nothing that we're, we're going to get from that kid. Mm -mm. I mean, and, the, and there's nothing that we're going to get from that kid to give to you guys that we haven't already distilled in the conversation that we have on this podcast. And so I think when, and then when I, when I, when I shut people down, I think they take it like a, it's a slide at that kid who doesn't, who are like, Oh, or I think I'm, I think we're better than it. No, it's not that it's that I know where that person is at in their career. They are, they're at a place where they're reading the science like crazy mm -hmm. and they really understand how to write programming. That's mm -hmm. awesome. But we've not only done all that, but we've gone 
deep on the kettlebell side, deep on the unconventional side, deep on the strong, on the powerlifting, on the mobilities. Like we've gone deep and found the experts in all of those areas and we've studied those people. And then we've taken from all of them to, and then we've also taken from our own personal experience of training for Just decades. Just working with the regular people. Yeah, and to if it's something it we're not as familiar with, we bring those experts those on. Those I love. So when someone yeah. gives me a recommendation, let's give an example. Eldoa. I didn't even know what the fuck Eldoa was 10 years ago. Yeah. So when someone's like, uh, and introduce me into a something like that, yeah. I'm very intrigued by that person. I'm not intrigued by some YouTube kid who's who's really good trainer yeah this doesn't intrigue me like the what yeah like keep going like we'll apply to you keep going yeah, yeah right good go, job but it's yeah. not something that like i bring on the show and think like oh this person could add lots of value to our audience but introducing something like eldoa i think that is in, incredible totally. and I'm, I'm learning from that kettlebell is not that long ago okay less than a decade ago was really uncharted territory for me not that long ago bringing somebody like a dr brink or a kelly starrett or someone like that that's a mobility expert like that, that to me is stuff that I like to introduce our audience to, or that's the stuff that I would say that we are constantly pulling from or trying to learn from. There's just not a lot left out there that we haven't explored and you and taken something from it to build into our programming. Next question is from Tazy Kloppers. How can you beat the midday slump when bulking? Oh, that's a tough one. That happened to me. That happens to me when I'm, when I bump my calories Here's what I found that helps me. If I can control the blood sugar crash from eating a lot of carbohydrates, I feel okay. So what I've noticed for myself, and I've noticed with other people as well that I've worked with, that if they, when they're doing their bulk, if they go real carb heavy early on, they'll get this crash later on in the afternoon. There's a couple ways that I've worked around it. One is increasing my calories, not completely avoiding carbs. I think that's really tough to bulk with. But rather, you know, making more of a focus on proteins and fats. They don't tend to do that with me. So I'll eat more of the carbs later in the evening because then I'm going to go to bed anyway. So it's not that big of a deal. And or when I do eat my meals, I'll eat the protein first and then I'll eat the carbohydrates. And we now have CGM uh, research that shows that that does help with that blood sugar crash. Because that's what happens with a lot of people with the, blood with the, with the slump is they get the, the rise and blood sugar, then the insulin goes up to get out of to get to get that out of the blood. Then you get that crash, and you get irritable and, and sleepy and tired. So we're we're invested in a company called NutriSense, and this is an area where I see tremendous value, especially for a question like this, uh, because there there's such an individual variance. Totally. So like, and maybe it's it's not the carbs you think it is. Maybe it's the avocado. You know, or maybe it's the banana. Like you don't know what it is that could be causing that that spike that you're talking about. And I think there's tremendous value, even if you're somebody who's not like borderline diabetic, but using a tool like this to like get an idea of how these different foods are affecting you. And I think you'll get. I, I think it'll open your eyes a lot. And it, I mean, it did me. I mean, I'd share with you guys that the the whole the whole taco thing versus the like two bites of a cinnamon roll yeah. difference. It was like wild to me how my body responded differently to those two foods. So I think you wearing something like that to get an idea. And so then if you're trying to avoid that, you realize like, oh, wow, every time I eat these types of foods, this is how my midday feels. If I switch that meal to this type of meal, it really powers me through my midday and I feel fine. I think that's very valuable information for somebody, even though that might not make the difference of you building 15 pounds, I can't sell it to you that way or losing 10 pounds of fat. It's that having that insight on how those foods affect you and make you feel through day. I mean, that can have long-term well, effects. It has huge effects on your behaviors, which, yeah. which obviously will affect uh, your success. Here's a couple also uh, areas that you might not look. One is sleep quality. Now, here's why I'm bringing that up. When bulking, especially for men, okay, this can be true for women as well, but especially for men, even if your bulk is lean, sleep quality can decrease because of the increase in snoring, and sleep apnea. Okay. So I, I experienced this myself. I'm lean. I know I'm, I'm probably single digit body fat at the most. I'm maybe 10% body fat right now, but because I'm carrying about 15 pounds more muscle than I was before, um, I snore now. My sleep quality isn't the same and it has to do with the musculature of the neck and all that kind of stuff. So pay attention to that. So if you're bulking and you're noticing man, I'm just more tired throughout mm -hmm. the day, it may be that your sleep quality isn't as good. And it doesn't mean you wake up throughout the night. It could literally mean, ask your partner like, hey, am I snoring more? 
you know, when I go to sleep. And then the other one is your caffeine intake. Uh, we just talked about yeah, this earlier in the, pos- in the podcast. Sure. Like, bring that yeah, up. go ahead. Because no, yeah, that's the big, big one I noticed, you know, is, is if I can manipulate that uh, based off of like, if that's too high and then I have like two in terms of like the amount of calories per meal, like if I'm trying to do like this huge meal, um, sometimes, you know, if I can spread that out a little bit more throughout the day and yeah. like maybe make more meals out of it instead of like these huge meals that then I, I feel this inevitable, you know, sort of a, a bonk, uh, that, that I might have midday, uh, between caffeine and, and the big meals for me, that's always, dude, that I'm so glad you said, that. I totally forgot about that. That's hundred percent true. If I go, if I did three big meals versus six small meals, I'll get more of a crash with the big meals. If yep. I eat a big meal about an, an hour later, I want to go to sleep. If I eat like a small ones, I don't get that same crash. I'm so glad you said that. You should try that as well with your bulking is maybe give yourself more, but smaller, more frequent meals and see how that Agreed. affects your, your energy. Next question is from bad Seki. What are your thoughts on MK six, seven, seven? Is it good or bad depending on your body type? Is that like uh, AK forty seven? No, I was thinking MK Ultra. That's all I know. No, this is uh, ibutamorin. It's another name for. Oh, that's what that is. The peptide. Oh, Oh, okay. Okay. I've heard of that. Okay. So this is interesting. So if you had asked me this question a couple years ago, I would have not had very much information. But now we work with a company. Um, You can go to mphormones.com, in fact, and you can get an assessment. Uh, from their their staff there and work with a doctor and they do hormone therapy, hormone replacement, and they work with peptides. Okay. So this is a peptide. So before I get into what it is, I do want to say this. Peptides are uh, like drugs in the sense that um, they're not innocuous, you know, supplements that you take and, oh, try it out and see if it works. It's like a herb. They have real effects in the body. Okay. And so I do not think it's a good idea to take any peptides without first getting evaluated by a, a trained doctor and, and also getting monitored because they do have distinct effects on the body. And this means that for some people, it's going to be great. And for other people, it's not going to be good at all. Okay. So hey, let's talk about ibutamorin. So I've, I've been on this now on and off. I've cycled on and off it now for maybe a, a few times, maybe three times. And I find it very interesting. Now, I've experimented with some of the other peptides because, again, we work with the uh, some doctors, and now I have access and I have monitoring. So I can literally say, hey, let me try this. They'll look at my blood work and say, okay, I think this may be a good, idea, a good idea to try. Then I'll be on it, and then they'll test me in a month and be like, oh, here's what's happening. Not good, good. Plus, I base it off of how I feel, all that stuff. So ibutamorin is a, was known as a secretagogue. It's a growth hormone releaser. So it's a ghrelin, the hormone ghrelin mimic, meaning it's not ghrelin, but it attaches uh, to the ghrelin receptor. So does it manipulate the appetite at all? Well, I'm going to get to that. So because it mimics ghrelin, it sends a signal to the pituitary to pump out more growth hormone. And it's Mm. very effective. Literally, you test your growth hormone on ibutamorin, it's almost like taking one and a half to two IUs of growth hormone a day. So people who aren't familiar, if you were to go on growth hormone therapy, let's say you went to one of these these labs. Aging and you to, clinics or whatever. Yeah, anti-aging they put, clinic. They put you on three IUs a they day. They would put you on, you know, they put you on around one or two, actually. Three is actually kind of high. Most oh, of them, really? Yeah, yeah, bodybuilders will go higher, even higher, right? But oh, yeah. two, one to two is therapeutic dose of growth hormone. Well, ibutamorin will make your body produce about that much too. And the IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor, even higher than what you may get from growth hormone. Uh, Now, what does this do for the body? Well, more growth hormone means you're going to build, repair faster. You're going to have better tendon repair, muscle growth. Your sleep is going to be, typically people experience better sleep. Your skin is nicer. Your hair grows faster. Your nails grow faster. So like all all these things that are associated with growth hormone, you get from taking it, it's oral, so you don't have to inject anything, it's literally a pill, you take it at night. Um, what are the side effects, the negatives? Well, first let's talk about the, the people who probably don't wanna mess with this. If you raise growth hormone, either by taking growth hormone or by taking ibutamorin or MK677, if you have blood sugar control issues, not a good idea. Growth hormone goes up, insulin becomes less effective. So if you have like, genetics for potential for diabetes or you're not very healthy, your blood sugar is hard to control or it's kind of high, 
this will make it not a good thing. This is why you need to get tested because if you don't know this about yourself, now is it you a, could accelerate like is that a temp- is that a temporary effect or is it long like after the uh, even afterwards temporary? But if you go on it long enough and you keep growth hormone high long enough, you could cause yourself some issues if you have issues with blood sugar and stuff. This is why this is one of the reasons why it's important to monitor. Okay, side effects uh, because it's a ghrelin mimic. My appetite goes up. Okay. So I do get hungrier when I take it. So I know growth hormone burns more body fat, which is true. If your growth hormone goes up, you do get leaner, but you also get hungrier when you take this particular one. Well, so, good for bulking though, for some reason. Yeah, very much. You sense. also will hold a little bit of water in the muscles. So the pumps that I get are really intense and I do gain intracellular like water in my muscle. And for me, it's more of a bulking agent. So when I take it, I can pretty reliably gain five to six pounds on the scale. I'm stronger. I get really vivid dreams. I sleep really hard. Uh, my skin, I start to notice is, you know, kind of looks a little younger. Jessica will, will, will notice that kind of stuff. I also notice though with the CGM that my blood sugar comes up a little higher. Now, because I have good blood sugar and I'm healthy, it's not a big deal, but I do notice oh, a, interesting. Little, a little bit of that effect. Oh, yeah. Wow. I'll, I'll look at my numbers and I'll see like, oh, it's, it's trending a little higher than normal. So if I were somebody that were like borderline blood sugar, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take, I wouldn't take growth hormone, nor would I take uh, ibutamorin. Uh, but it's interesting. It's fast. It's not a SARM. So it doesn't attach to the androgen receptor. It doesn't cause downregulation of, uh, you know, make your body produce less of its own hormones or anything like that. Um, there's, there's studies on it that, you know, because, and the reason why it exists in the first place is that pharmaceutical companies were looking for a way to treat children with pituitary deficiencies mm. without having to give them growth hormone. And it seems to have a lot of promise there. What makes something a peptide and what makes something a SARM? And why is why is a peptide so They're, much safer than a SARM? It's not safer. It's just different. Uh, although in this case, I would say it is in, in, from what I've read. But SARM stands for Selective Androgen Receptor Modulator. So the androgen receptor is what testosterone attaches to. So a SARM is a drug that's not testosterone, but still attaches to the receptor and, and it tricks your body into thinking it has more androgens. This does not interact with the androgen receptor. It attaches to the ghrelin receptor. Okay. So I don't know what the term would be for that, but now peptide is, an, is a word that means a chain of amino acids, which so, so basically a peptide is a very general um, term that can mean a lot of different things. But this is a, it's a secret. It, this affects growth hormone. It has nothing to do with testosterone. Has nothing to do with, you know, those anabolic hormones. So does it does it make it any more or less risky than SARMs? Then, uh, I would not go on a SARM uh, because if I want to have more androgens, I would go with testosterone, which I already make. It's we know what it does. We know what it doesn't do. It's very safe. Uh, so long as you don't go crazy, right? So like if you take it and get your testosterone up to good, high, normal levels, it'll improve your health versus if they were low. SARMs are, they're trying to do the job of testosterone and what they're trying to do is make it make it side effect free, but they haven't been around long enough. They don't have the, the history. It's like, if you're going to go on something to do that, you might as well go on testosterone. Mm. You know what I'm saying? The only application I could see with SARMs in the future would be uh, where you would want maybe to give a woman more, um, you, you know, more of the androgen effect without the masculinizing effects of testosterone. But even in those cases, like you give a woman a little bit of testosterone, it's a hormone she already makes. So, but something like this, fascinating. Cause if you want to raise your growth hormone, you have to take growth hormone. This is not taking growth hormone. This is telling your body to make its own growth hormone even more. Yes. Yeah, really so interesting. Peptides, because I know that SARMs are kind of in that gray market classification, right? So it's like you can technically get them on the internet, but it's like through veterinary sources or whatever, however that works. Um, is how how does it work for peptides? Same, same. Yeah. So you could you could go online right now and buy ibutamorin or MK six seven seven. Uh, I don't recommend it. I think it's a bad idea. It's especially because you don't yeah, know. You're not doctor supervised. No, that's so dumb to me. I, I think that's such a bad uh, approach. I think if you want to go with peptides, you could go and now we've, uh, you know, we've done the work here. So we've, there was lots of places that tried to get us to work with them. We picked the ones that we thought were the best. Um, again, you can go to mphormones.com. And if you get on with some of them, they'll do the whole lab workup 
And then, and there's more than just this, right? There's uh, BP BPC one five seven, which mm-hmm. uh, accelerates wound healing. I found the difference. Healing, that. Yeah, yeah, it's got some effects on the gut that seem to be very interesting and positive. There's a there's a uh, another peptide. I can't remember the name of it. That is a, uh, a mel- melano. I, I can't think. I can't think of the, the chemical term, but it was designed to help people tan without sun. One of the side effects oh, being uh-huh. increased libido, especially in post post menopausal women. Tan and so, horny. So 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 as a as a libido enhancer, it's got some interesting effects. Um, there's a lot of these 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 this category of things that you could take that I think you would be, it would be very wise to work with a, a professional who monitors you. And then you could derive some very interesting, cool benefits. If you don't, it's like you're little, it would be literally like going to the pharmacy and buying a bunch of pharmaceuticals and then being like, I think I'm okay. Yeah. I think I feel this. I think I don't like you're messing with your, with Just your health. Guesstimating, here. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't raise, I would not take anything that affected my growth hormone that much. If I couldn't also watch. Yeah my blood work and everything else to make sure that was doing, you know, pretty well. And like I said, I've tried it a few times. It's a, it's an effective bulker for bulk and strength. I notice right away, uh, from taking it. Um, but even, you know, even with those effects, I still, I only go on it for 30, 60 days. And I typically go off 30, 60 days. I don't think it's necessary to do that, but I just do. Cause I think that's wise when you're taking um, anything. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets. At the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injuries.